So I'd like to briefly uh, introduce Chanel Lowry, who will host this virtual training. Chanel is a doctoral student in the School of Social Work at the University of Minnesota and a graduate assistant to Dr. Seema Samimi, who is the lead researcher on the project. Welcome, Chanel. Hi, uh, thank you, Stacey. Thank you so much. Um, and I just wanna say thank you to Cashew um, for just allowing me to host this webinar in partnership with um, Dr. Seema Samimi. I'm really excited to share this information and to kind of um, get this research out there. And um, I just wanna other, also emphasize that throughout this presentation, I'll be kind of sharing a lot of information about the study and then interventions. And so I welcome questions throughout and there'll also be time for questions at the end, um, but feel free to write in the chat if you have any questions throughout the presentation. Um, and then Stacey's gonna help me with kind of letting me know if people have questions so I can definitely take a pause and answer any questions that people have throughout the presentation. Um, so I'm going to start with just kind of uh, introducing myself. I know Stacy did um, as well, but I, uh, like Stacy said, I'm a doctoral student here at the University of Minnesota in the School of Social Work. I'm currently in my third year um, and I'm working, I've been working with Dr. Seema Samini for the past two years on this project. I'm originally from Pennsylvania. Um, I moved here about three years ago and I've been in the field of social work for about 10 years. Um, my experience ranges between community integration, housing, and mental health services, and I'm currently a psychotherapist. Um, so I really enjoy what I do, um, and I also enjoy research and kind of thinking about how research then connects to practice, and so that's another reason I'm really excited about doing this webinar today. Um, I also use she, her, hers pronouns, um, so that's about, that's me, and then for, like I said, for the past two years, I've been working with Dr. Seema Samimi. Um, they use they, them, theirs pronouns. And Dr. Seema Samimi is an assistant professor at the School of Social Work in the College of Human, uh, of Education and Human Development at the University of Minnesota. Um, they are also a restorative justice practitioner and they have been for over 20 years and they volunteered um, as a circle facilitator and mediator. Um, SEMA's research really examines the intersections of service organizations, societal systems, criminalization, and race, um, and then how these impact young people. And so SEMA really believes that institutions um, have to prioritize um, the needs of uh, the youth. And so that's where their research kind of aligns. and. Um, so for this presentation, we are going to be just popping and looking at the chat. Um, we're going to be, it's, it's gonna be two parts. So the first part of this presentation is really focused on the research study that um, Dr. Samimi and I have been working on for the past two years. So I wanna give a little bit of background on that study. Um, give you some information about the study. And then um, there is different parts of the study, but this particular uh, webinar is gonna focus on parental perspectives. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the parental perspectives that we uncovered in our research and then talk about the additional considerations. The second part of this webinar is focused on engaging um, with parents around school discipline and online learning. And so I'm going to talk about some interventions. Two of those interventions are more general. And then I'm going to go over a specific intervention um, called MST, multi-systemic therapy. Um, I'm also going to provide some resources around that particular intervention. And then I'm going to move into Q&A. So I want to leave plenty of time for everyone to ask questions if they have them. Um, and, then, and then just... Uh, I also be available if anybody has questions after, you know, sometimes you think of questions after, so I'm completely fine with answering any questions anyone has afterwards as well, the email. Okay, so the name of the study that Seema and I conducted um, is called Pushed Out at Home, School Discipline During COVID-19. And um, this study, was started about two years ago. So we were still kind of in the pandemic. 
And um, so in terms of the background for this particular study, um, we talk about disruptions happening in all sectors of life due to the COVID-19 pandemic on, on all levels and within all systems. So, um, you know, there was a lot of disruption and a lot of maneuvering that had to happen during the pandemic. Um, and so we talk about that in the background of our, of our study. And also communities of color were disproportionately affected by the physical, emotional, and economic harm due to the uh, magnified social, political, socio-political, racial, and environmental stressors um, that were magnified by the crisis. Um, so I do want to point out that it's not that these things weren't already happening. Um, it was just that the COVID-19 pandemic kind of illuminated them in a very um, different way and put everything kind of on the forefront. And also with the murder of George Floyd, um, there was just a lot happening and a lot was coming to light in terms of just the disproportionality of physical, emotional, and economic harm. Um, and so when we think about how that impacts school systems, um, the next point I want to make is that uh, discipline practices, exclusionary discipline practices in schools, such as out-of-school suspensions, expulsions, and even taking children out of the classroom and putting them into other spaces, um, that those kind of things disproportionately affect students from marginalized communities. Um, and this has been something that you know, has been going on for a while. There's a lot of research to support that. Um, and so that is kind of where we started at. That was kind of the grounding point of doing this research. And additionally, um, in terms of background, you know, research does show that exclusionary practices, like I mentioned before, with um, in-school suspension, out-of-school suspension, um, Kind of expulsion and just taking kids out of the classroom, um, those result in lower academic achievement and dropout and then contact with the juvenile justice system for students. And just like I mentioned in on the previous slide about this disproportionately affecting um, communities, marginalized communities, communities of color, um, it's the same thing with these kind of um, results in terms of lower academic achievement, dropout rates, and contact with the juvenile justice system. Um, in, in Dr. Samimi's research, um, they often talk about a, a school to prison pipeline. And so, you know, the antithesis of doing this research is to kind of disrupt that. And so we learned through the research process, you know, staying connected to learning communities has been shown to have a range of positive outcomes for students. And that ranges from um, academic achievement to emotional well-being. And both are very important to the success of students within school systems at all levels. And so um, in terms of parents' involvement here, um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, parents uh, were asked to take on both disciplinary and educational roles that were more immediate than they had been before. And they were asked to do these things while also continuing to face the demands that they had as parents, um, as employees, and just in life. And so um, there was just additional stressors placed on parents with their children now being at home um, doing school and them having to juggle work, um, educating, and uh, being that kind of disciplinary mediator with the school. And so that's kind of where we centered the background of the study. And in terms of thinking about how we went on to collect the data and um, do the study, that's where we were grounded in. So for this study, we had three main research questions. Um, and those were, the first one was, what do students, parents, and school staff members identify as key elements of school discipline while distance learning? So we anticipated that there would be a shift in how school discipline was handled during the COVID-19 pandemic because of the transition to online learning. And so that was our main research question, like what, what does it look like? Um, what are the key elements of discipline 
in those kind of environments. And then our second question was, how do students and their parents experience school discipline while distance learning? So really this got at like, what is the experiences of the students and parents? And so it was really important to get that information and talk to them about, you know, what they were experiencing. Um, and just knowing that parents are going to have a different perspective than students. And so getting both of those perspectives was really important, which is why we included both elements in the research question. And then the third question we had was, how do students and parents perceive school discipline to impact different races differently, if at all? And so the uh, this question came from just our background knowledge that I just went over in terms of marginalized communities being differentially affected and treated. And so we wanted to know um, the perception in terms of the impact of school discipline, and especially within these online environments, if that kind of shifted as well and um, continued. And so we were really interested in that as well. So additionally, with the study information, um, our focus was students, parents, and teachers. And we were, our, um, our sample was drawn from public schools in Minnesota. So the participants were students that were at, pu were at public schools in the state of Minnesota, their parents, and then teachers who taught at public schools in Minnesota. Um, and so our data collection method that we use was having semi-structured Zoom interviews and focus groups. So the focus groups that we did were with teachers. Um, we had two rounds of focus groups, and then we did semi-structured interviews with parents and uh, students. And um, they didn't necessarily need to be like, you know, related, like in terms of students, the parents, and the teachers. Um, so it came from, you know, different schools, different um, places within the, you know, the Twin City metro area mostly. And then the data analysis process that we used, oh, I want to mention one more thing about the data collection. So the interviews were ranged from 30 minutes to an hour, sometimes more, um, to, for us to go through the questions that we had. and. Um, and then in terms of the, the data analysis, we did thematic coding of the interview transcript. So basically we recorded the Zoom interviews and then we had a trans we transcribed them. So we wrote out everything that was said. And then with those transcribed interviews, we then went through um, first cleaning them and then coding them to just uncover what the major themes were related back to our research questions. And so we were looking for things related to school discipline, their experiences with that, um, given the questions that we asked and then the context. And so in doing that, um, we were able to, when it came to the parent parental perspectives, we have uh, three major themes. Um, it's supposed to say one, two, and three, <laughs> but we had three major, three major themes. We also had themes for, you know, students and teachers. And so we were able to gather a lot of information um, just about the different perspectives. And it, we found that there were, um, there were different perspectives when it came to the students and the, and the teachers and the parents. So as we're focusing on this webinar for the parental perspectives, I'm going to just kind of hone in on focus on that. So the major themes that we found for parents were um, just the changes to school discipline and what that looked like for them was having more contact with the school. Um, and then the second theme was just this uh, idea of struggling to balance it all. And then um, this prioritization of family and uh, child well-being over academic goals. And so um, these were there are other ones that were kind of sprinkled throughout, but these were the ones that stood out the most to, to um, me and Dr. Samimi. And so we kind of wanted to focus on these. And next, I kind of want to go into some quotes that we got from 
the parents related to these three different perspectives. So the first theme was changes in school discipline. Um, so I have two quotes here from parents of students in middle school, two different parents. Um, and so the one says they would immediately email me or call me, and then I would go into the room and I would find her sleep and I would have to wake her up. So just to give you some context, this particular interview, um, which I conducted, was um, with a parent who had a child in middle school. They were able to work from home. And they just kind of talked about um, when I mentioned school discipline and kind of how that showed up for them, they just mentioned that um, it wasn't necessarily like their child was getting in trouble. It was just they were notified and emailed a lot if, you know, their their student um, didn't come into class. And it was more of an immediate thing as opposed to maybe you're notified after school when the child is in school that they're not in class, but this was more like you get an email right away while class is going on um, to let you know like, hey, your kid is not in the class. Um, so she would get that notification. And then, you know, she said she would go up there and find her, her child sleeping and just wake her up and have her log into her class. Um, but she said there wasn't, you know, she didn't really get in trouble for that. It was kind of like understood. And there was a lot of leniency and um, understanding on the teacher's part. So the second quote says, I would say there was increased communication. I was getting a lot more emails about like, hey, your student hasn't submitted all these assignments and their grade is here. So for this particular, um, for this particular person, uh, this parent, they were talking about kind of just like, like it says, getting a lot more emails and more emails about related to assignments, particular assignments that their student had not completed and just letting them know what their grade is at that point. Um, so again, it was this emphasis around, they're not in trouble, but it's like, these are the things that they have to you know, turn in to get their grade to this point. Um, both of the parents mentioned that there was more understanding um, from the school administration in terms of um, just the kind of behaviors that they were seeing with students maybe not turning things in um, or not coming to class uh, on time and things like that. So that was the main theme around what changes look like in school discipline. Another thing I want to point out is that um, parents oftentimes mentioned that they weren't always around um, or in the vicinity of their child when they were doing their schoolwork, especially the older children. So these two quotes are from um, parents who had children in middle school. And so they um, they were, all, both of them were working from home and they were often in different spaces. And so when I would ask about like, you know, did you see any discipline going on in the classroom, in the online classroom at that time? And they would kind of respond with, no, because I wasn't really around. I was, you know, in another room doing my work and if they needed help, I would, you know, pop in and help them. Or if I got an email from the school, I would, you know, check and see what's going on. But it wasn't a lot of kind of like uh, I was right there watching the whole thing. So that's another factor to, to point out. So in terms of the second theme, um, all the parents talked about, you know, how it was a struggle to kind of balance everything. So... Um, this first quote is from a parent of seven students. Um, they have seven, seven children. And so uh, she says, it was hopeless. It was really hopeless. That was the feeling that personified the whole time. Overwhelmingly, overwhelming hopelessness. Um, so yeah, in this context, she was just saying that, you know, things were really overwhelming um, and having to manage the you know, having ch seven children in school, um, it was a lot. And trying to navigate systems was really hard. Um, and navigating the spaces in terms of um, the the online tools and the apps and the things that the the systems that the students and the school was using was was hard. Um, another parent said, I had to throw anything and everything school related out. Like it was not a punishable offense anymore because if I can't keep track of it, I can't expect them, the children, to keep track of it. So 
in this context, when she says throw everything out school, that is school related, she means like not punishing the kids for um, things that maybe they would get in trouble for in school if it was like turning in assignments or being late with something because she, in this interview, she mentioned that she was trying to figure out how her um, her children were supposed to navigate these these um, applications and uh, turn in their assignments, but it was hard for her to even navigate those things. And so she felt like I can't punish them um, if they can't figure it out because it's hard for me to even figure it out to be able to help them. Um, she did mention that, you know, down the line, she was able to get some support from the school to be able to navigate those. And they were lenient and helpful in terms of not punishing, but um, just trying to navigate all that with three with the three children, she said was difficult. And then the last quote um, says, I just felt like I was down here working in the basement and he was upstairs pretending he was learning. And so um, with this, in this context, the parent really emphasized that um, she understood that it was going to be difficult for her child who was used to being in spaces with other people to um, kind of stay engaged in the process. And so um, it was kind of this understanding of like, he's going to do the best he can, and I'm going to do the best I can, and I still have to work and things like that. And so something has to kind of give. So those were, um, so that was the second theme in terms of struggling to balance it all. And then the third and final theme that we uncovered was this prioritizing well-being over academic goals. And so a lot of the parents talked about that their main focus was keeping their children safe and healthy and themselves safe and healthy and their you know, family safe and healthy. And so this parent says, in thinking about surviving a pandemic, I was much more interested in maintaining our mental health and our strong relationship than becoming somebody who policed his learning time. So I made intentional decisions about that. And I would say he did not learn a whole lot in the 15 months of the pandemic, but I'm still very comfortable with the decision I made. And so this is a parent of a student in middle school. And through the interview, um, she talked about the things that she would help him with in terms of school um, and turning his assignments and kind of just getting through the process of uh, navigating the systems. Um, but she did emphasize that her, like she, like it says in the quote, that her priority was making sure that he was okay and that he was healthy and they were okay. Um, and so I think it was just this acceptance of, yeah, there's going to be some loss here in terms of maybe academic goals, but as long as you know the child is healthy and their family is healthy, that is the overall. Um, that's what's really that's what's really important. And so. In thinking about those things, um, some additional considerations would be um, just thinking about the work schedule and conditions of the parents. So all of the parents that we interviewed were able to um, and had the privilege of working from being able to work from home or not be out of the house too, too much. But I also um, want to just point out that during the pandemic, we had a lot of essential workers doing amazing work um, and helping communities um, and things like that, especially in healthcare settings and at grocery stores and all kinds of places. Um, and those parents um, had different work schedules and they may not have been able to be as present with the children in their school environments and spaces. Um, and so also considering the kind of working conditions they were under, and then additionally uh, is the consideration of the developmental needs of students. And so students who maybe had um, IEPs and um, maybe had different challenges and needed some support, um, it wasn't very clear if they were able to get those that support. And talking to one of the participants, um, they mentioned that their son had a really good friend who um, Pat was autistic and he did not really get the services that he needed in that time frame, um, just because of the lack of resources and, um, 
the just the shifting and changing environment that we were in during the pandemic. And so those are just additional considerations um, when thinking about this research and um, who, who we were able to talk to uh, about their experiences, the parental experiences during this time. So before I kind of transition into talking about engaging with parents, I just wanna pause and see if there's any questions about the research study um, or anything else that I mentioned before, uh, before I move on. So I'm gonna just take a pause and see if there's any, and just like look at the chat and see if there's any questions. Okay, so um, as we move forward, I'm going to shift into talking about engaging with parents about school discipline and online learning. And so, um, Chanel, sorry to interrupt. There is a question if you're able to back up. Sure, absolutely. Okay. So, um, okay, I see the question. Um, Amy says, I'm wondering how you engage people in focus groups. I'm finding in my work, engaging with youth who are disengaged has been a difficult task. Okay, so thank you for your question, Amy. Um, and what I would say to that is with the focus groups, we, our focus groups were with teachers. So we didn't have focus groups with um, students. But in terms of engaging students, because that was a little bit more challenging, I would say, um, in terms of getting student participants, um, the, we had an incentive of a gift card. And so that was helpful. But I also found that students tended to talk less about the subject. Um, so kind of getting them engaged, uh, there was a lot more rapport building in the beginning I, that I did. Um, and kind of just using my therapeutic skills in terms of uh, building that rapport with students to get them to kind of open up and want to talk about their experiences. Because a lot of times it was, um, they came to want to do it because maybe their parent, their parent might have done an interview and said that they uh, had a child and maybe interested. And then they told them that they could get a gift card and they were like, okay, I'll do it. Um, so that was one of the ways, but I know that it is hard. Um, to engage youth sometimes um, when about these things. And then I see another question from Ramo. I'm, I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, did the study share culture, people from foreign countries views of discipline from the teacher parent perspective? So in our focus group, um, in our focus groups, we had people of different races, but there wasn't, from my, to my knowledge, there wasn't people from different countries, um, but that is a very interesting and important aspect of uh, discipline in terms of teacher and parent perspectives. Um, there, I would say that in terms of parental perspectives, um, there wasn't anyone from a foreign country, but we did have um, an indigenous participant who talked about um, more of the communal aspect of engaging with um, and connecting with the school and their uh, child kind of um, how going through online learning was difficult um, just because of that communal component. Um, so that, that was some of the ways that we engage with culture, but <clears throat> not in terms of, um, people from foreign countries. So that would have been <clears throat> a really interesting component to, to explore further. And that's something that we can probably do. Yeah. Discipline is, is different in different cultures, um, for sure, for sure. And that, that <clears throat> that is a consideration that has to be a consideration when we think about school discipline too, is that cultural um, relevance and things like that, that cultural fit. So I appreciate the question. 
I'm, I'm just going to pause a second just for any other questions that might come up before I move on. I don't want to miss anyone's question. Okay. And Stacy, just stop me if anything else pops up. Will do. All righty. So as we move on to interventions, um, again, it should say one, two, three. But the interventions, two of them are um, general, and then one is, is specific. Um, and so the first intervention is kind of making connections across systems to get a fuller understanding of, of what's going on. So, and these interventions are based on like, um, in terms of child protective workers and um, engaging with families, right? If there are truancy concerns, which were happening in before COVID and during COVID in online learning. And so this is where the, these interventions are centered. So let's say a child is, is not going to school, is not going to their classes. And how can we, um, as, as child protective workers, engage in that process of um, getting that child back connected to school? Um, so the first, like I said, the first intervention is really making connections across systems to get a fuller understanding. And that includes the family system, that includes the school system, and any other kind of uh, services that the child may be involved with or the family may be involved with. Um, kind of like taking a holistic view of, of what's going on and knowing that um, the child is a part of a, a larger system. And there could be many reasons why the student is not going to school. Um, and so we wanna be mindful to, like I said, connect across the systems to kind of get a better understanding. The second um, intervention is connecting families to appropriate resources. And so if, if you find that, you know, there is a need in, in, the, in the household um, that's apparent, or that has been communicated, it's important to focus on that, making sure basic needs are met um, so that people can have access to the resources that they need. And then in turn, that's gonna affect um, the system and the child being able to show up. Um, I always kind of think about, um, you know, students who are missing school, um, for various reasons, if they're like trying to get other resources like food and things like that for their family, or if there's a crisis right in the family um, and things like that, and the school and the school is not aware, so that can prevent them from being in school or even just being present um, and I mean like um, engaged really in school. And so those those are it's very important to think about that as well, and then. Um, the last intervention that I'm going to talk to talk about is multi-systemic therapy referrals. Um, and I'm going to go into more detail about that. But so let's talk about first the connecting across systems. So that would include like talking to parents and other family who is involved with the child. Um, and it's really important to have an understanding of the culture and the family dynamics in terms of talking with parents and other family, a lot of times in other cultures, um, other family is very involved and is a, a big part of the upbringing of the child. And so it's important to keep those connections and um, include them in, in um, thinking about how to help the child. So um, also connecting with any services uh, the child or family is receiving. Um, so if they are working with the school and they do have an IEP or they're working with um, a therapist or something like that, it's important to make those connections to, like I said in the beginning, to get a fuller picture of what's going on. The other thing is connecting with the school um, and administration and teachers to understand what's going on at the, at the school and just um, how that's impacting their home and vice versa so that there can be an intervention strategy established to make change and get the student reacclimated to being in school on a regular basis.
And then when we think about connecting to resources, um, like I was saying, that's just making sure their basic needs are met and connecting the family and child to those needed resources. If it's outside the scope of their basic needs, there's still important needs that are there that um, can be useful in terms of the connection of resources. And so, um, yeah, just emphasizing that having those resources in the home and having the family and child having what they need is going to help them to be successful in um, all the other areas. Okay, and then specifically thinking about multi-systemic therapy referral, I just want to first talk about what it is, right? So multi-systemic therapy or MST um, is a community-based intensive family-driven approach for young people who are at risk of custody or being placed in child protective services due to their own behavior. So these referrals can happen if the child is truant, um, if they're engaged in um, detrimental behavior like drinking or drug use or um, behavior in schools that is isn't putting other people in danger. Um, the focus of this treatment modality is really to empower the caregivers to solve future problems and current problems that are that are going on to help the child. And then this modality is based on a social ecological approach where the client is actually the entire community of the young person. So this includes family, peers, school, local, and the local community. So you can think of it as like a system. Um, so the, the client is actually the whole system. With the, with the general focus on the, the young person, but um, they're not detached from their peers, their family, their school, and their local community. And so that's the reason that the, the client is the entire community with this, with this treatment modality. And then I have a, um, this is the framework that's used. So MST looks to improve family functioning. And with the improving of the family functioning, it then kind of translates into the improvement of relationships with, with peers, with school, and with the community. Um, and so the goal is to reduce antisocial behaviors and improve the youth's functioning. Um, and this framework, like I said, it's connected to the ecological perspective that looks at the child as within a system and that system being impacted in, uh, by the child's behavior. And so then improving the systems would then impact the child's behavior to uh, ultimately improve the system itself. So in practice um, with MST, a single worker uh, works with the family inside the home or the school or the local community um, of that student. and so. It's very hands-on. There's a completion of a fit assessment to determine the problematic behaviors and identify what is actually the driving force behind them to then um, get at those and reduce those. And typically this intervention lasts for three to five months. Um, and the focus is on the decreasing the referral behaviors and negotiating outcomes with family um, and key participants in the school and the community. So in terms of how MST is related to parental engagement, one of the main goals in terms of the parental aspect of it is that it is um, wanting to increase parental skills and improve uh, family relations and involve the student in more pro-social peer and activities with more, I'm sorry, with more pro-social peers and activities. So get them connected to different peer groups and they may be uh, currently, currently um, involved with and then get them, get them involved in activities that are gonna improve um, just their skills and what they're doing and the kind of activities they're engaged in which uh, and another goal in terms of parental engagement is to improve school attendance and creating a family support um, network as well. So these, um, I wanted to include some resources. So uh, like Stacy said, 
everyone everyone will have access to this PowerPoint. And these are hyperlinked. And so the Family Partnership and Hennepin County Children's Mental Health Collaborative, um, they both have information about MST and um, that a referral can be made for, for children and a family. And um, it's of no cost to the family. It's uh, has it is an evidence-based practice that has been utilized um, in other places and here it's been utilized in um, Minnesota and um, it it is um, it has really good results it is said that it has really good results and um, it improves you know outcomes and gets children back in school um, and doing well and um, targeting those like I said specific behaviors regarding how to improve um, the child's attendance and other just behaviors that may be um, hurting their academic performance with the goal of getting them to um, sustain their attendance in school and continue to do well and succeed academically and also emotionally as well. So um, that's really the, the information that I have. Let's see. And um, yeah, so that's the information that I have about the study and about the kind of interventions that can be used. And I am happy to take any questions now. Um, thank you all for, for listening. And um, thank you so much for your questions. And if anyone has any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, you can use the Q&A or the chat. We can give it a minute, Chanel. I know sometimes people need to- Yeah, yeah, formulate the question. Yeah, absolutely, no problem. Here we go. Okay, so Cassidy says, thank you. As a parent, I would agree. It was difficult to work from home and teach my kids. We did it, but some days were harder than others. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that comment, Cassidy. Um, and then did any parents talk about successes or challenges to system collaboration? Um, yeah. I mean, I would say in terms of successes, I think just being able to get in contact with the teachers and administrators more readily than before. Um, they talked about that a lot, you know, that sometimes the, the teacher would text them um, and they were able to have access and ask questions or even with them being on online, right? They talked about, you know, they were able, some of them had, you know, homeroom sessions where parents could come on and ask questions that they had. And so instead of having to wait, you know, for an email response, they were able to get the answers that they needed to their questions right away. Um, in, in the sense that it was more immediate and they was able to problem solve right there um, with, within the space with the teacher right there. So I think that was one of the things. And I think in terms of challenges, um, like I said, it was more of the balancing aspect and navigating the, the online systems was, was seemed to be challenging, the most challenging that the parents brought up um, and having to just navigate platforms for different kids and different grades, that was challenging. And just keeping track of all that and having um, a lot of emails from school about updates and things like that, and just trying to stay on top of everything. Yeah, thank you for that question. And then Rayanne, hope I'm saying your name right, says, this makes so much sense to me. Thank you for doing and sharing this research, so helpful. You're very welcome. And it looks like we have a question in the Q and A. If I can move this. I can help you too, Chanel, if you don't want to. Oh, I'm good, Stacey. I'm, it? Okay. Yeah. Great. So um, this question says, what about students who downright refuse to log on to their online school? I feel 
like myself, the parents and the school are in agreement and on next steps, but now the student needs to step up. Yeah. Um, so in this particular, in our study, we didn't, um, we didn't come across this, like the, their students would go to class, but I get that that could be a concern too. And I think that this is probably one, one of those times where the MST uh, kind of referral would be, would be helpful just because wanting to really understand like what is it that is having the student not want to engage. And if the, the parent and school is in agreement, that's really a good step forward in terms of kind of being able to team up and tackle the issue. Um, so this is where I would say like MST would probably be a really good um, tool and resource. So I think, um, let me see, oh, do we have another? Okay. So I do wanna make sure that you guys have time to take your, um, the survey that you have to do at the end um, so you can get your CEU. So I have another question. I'm gonna answer this question from Casey. I hope I'm saying your name right. Uh, forgive me if I didn't. And it says, I do truancy prevention in Washington County. And one of the challenges I've experienced this year is in-school truancy. This has posed a challenge as students are in the building, which causes parents to be frustrated. And obviously students aren't in school. So the school is frustrated. Has anyone else found an effective strategy to reduce in-school truancy? Um, so I just wanna make sure I understand that what I'm understanding about in-school truancy is like the student is in school in the building, but they're not in their classes. Um, so if I'm understanding that correctly, um, in terms of effect, effective strategies to reduce in-school truancy, again, I would say um, just getting at like what the root of the problem is and maybe the MST would be helpful in that um, I imagine the student is, you know, in the hallways or in some other part of the school or maybe right outside the school or something like that. And just kind of want to understand why they're not engaged in their classrooms or not in their classrooms and what is kind of the underlying uh, reasoning for, for that. Um, and... Is MST, so Julia says, is MST available in the community? I know most people only can do MST if they are county referred. Um, so honestly, I'm not 100% sure, but with the hyperlinks that I put in the presentation that you'll get, um, those, I think the first one might be, might be helpful in terms of um, the family partnership, because I know the Hennepin County would be like the county and the referrals can come through there. But maybe this other organization, which does have a person that you can contact um, for questions and things, that might be a good resource too. Um, yeah, and if anyone else knows uh, that that is helpful, it's, you can feel free to share the information. Um, so I am going to um, kind of just segue to uh, stopping sharing, but this is, I want to say thank you for like, again, listening. Um, and if you think of any questions outside of this, feel free to reach out, um, to me or Dr. Seema Samimi. I'm going to stop sharing so that Stacy can share. Thank you so much, Chanel. And for, um, following up on all those questions, that was really informative. And thank you to the audience and the attendees for, your engaging questions as well. We did put Chanel and Dr. Simi, Sima Samimi's email. So please reach out, like Chanel said. We will send a copy of this PowerPoint, um, of Chanel's PowerPoint and the recording to all registrants and um, along with a CEU to those of you who complete the evaluation. So we'll give a couple minutes. It will not take the whole seven minutes. Well, it could. Um, but when we, when we, uh, 
close this webinar, um, then just give it a second and the evaluation will pop up on your screen. I think it's five or six questions. And um, please, we'd love to hear your feedback. And um, that is also your ticket to your CEU. Thank you again, Chanel. And thank you, um, everybody, for attending. It was a great webinar.